the fires of hatred can burn deep and hidden. If you can imagine being stuck in the fires of hell, in this life most people won't experience it, but I've stood in hell and I'm still there. But fire consumes evidence, can protect a killer, can make it hard to distinguish rescuing hero from villain. If that was the first funeral that I've ever been to. But this killer reckoned without breakthrough forensic technology, unleashed by Merseyside police. It was a tragedy and a very, very difficult investigation for my team to work on. This was a crime which was born of anger and resentment. It was really an expression of power. It was a way of saying, you think I'm a spent force, but I can do things which you can't even imagine. And the result was absolutely tragic. Kieran Bimpson is a kickboxing champion from Merseyside. So are all five of his brothers. But this is me over here, um, talking to my brother about some techniques that we possibly could be demonstrating to students. And around about 1998, me and our did just become instructors in kickboxing. Family closeness is important for Kieran, although he's never lived with them on a permanent basis. He and his partner, Eleanor, have a family of their own. This is a video of our Francesca when she was three. Little Kieran when he was about 14 or 15, and Christina. There's things in life you can't replace, and being a father is the most amazing privilege that I've ever been given. I love my kids. I'm very protective over them, and in my life, I wanted the best for my kids. Eleanor is happy for this film to be made, but finds the story it will relate too distressing to take part in person. 2008, and she and her family were living in a comfortable house in the Liverpool suburb of Everton. Three-year-old Francesca was the rising star, coming into her own, endlessly filmed by her older siblings on their mobile phones. We always used to play games like the girls versus the boys, but there was only one boy who was young, so that was Kieran. Kieran is very large. But um, yes, he always has a laugh. And Amade is like, she's a big baby, really. <laughs> um, I'm quite quiet, actually. And Francesca was quiet, in our opinions. There wasn't like an age difference, really. Um, but me and Francesca were like the strongest. Like, we had a very good um, connection. Their mother, Eleanor, came, like Kieran, from a large family. She had four brothers and two older sisters, Linda and Tina. She was with her sisters in a Liverpool nightclub when she first met Kieran in 1990. When I went over to her, she wasn't really interested, so my mates were goading me to, you know, go and approach it again. Um, which I didn't do to the following week, and incidentally, she was in there again the following week. They began spending time together, including babysitting for her brother's child. She was only a little baby at the time, and you get quite maternal when you're around young babies, I think, and you start thinking to yourself, why don't we try for a baby? So it become a reality, you know. We decided to not get married because I don't think that having a ring on somebody's finger makes you love them anymore. I think your children create a bond with you, yourself and your partner. And it's flew 20 years and meeting her that night, you know. You never think when you meet someone that you're going to last with them that long. It's amazing. Eleanor continued to spend plenty of time with her sisters who lived nearby. <laughs> Eleanor has always had a an excellent relationship with her siblings. In particular, she was very close to her sisters, which was Linda and Tina. So in our house, we welcomed all of the family, as you do, and they in turn brought friends with them and partners. Linda, in her 40s and with two grown-up children, was newly single, 
After 20 years, she'd split up with her husband and had more recently broken up with a boyfriend. She'd started looking for other people in her life to fill that gap of being in a relationship. And the, the characters that I see Linda with were always strong characters, you know, quite Jack the Lad, quite loud. In 2006, she met another man named Graham Heaps in a local supermarket. Hi, girl. Hi, yeah. I know you, don't I? Yeah. Graham was about 40, lived with his mother in Everton, and worked as a labourer fitting out pubs. <laughs> the pair met at the Breck pub, and their relationship developed. Linda brought Graham to Kieran and Eleanor's house, and he met the family. But the relationship did not immediately feel like it was permanent. Linda and Graham were quite complicated as a relationship. I didn't see him like proper. I didn't even know they were together really. I just thought they were friends, but I knew that they would be sort of together, but not actually together. Graham in particular, however, was keen on keeping the relationship alive. But it was late 2008, and something was to happen which would change lives forever and raise one vital question. Can you tell villain from hero? The 1st of December 2008, Christmas is in the air. But for one family from Everton in Liverpool, this would be a Christmas like no other. The Bimpsons had no way of knowing their lives were about to change forever. Are we going to get a Christmas tree now if he says? We still don't have a Christmas tree and then we phoned me that up and said we want a Christmas tree. Hello. Yeah, you want the Christmas tree? When you're getting ready for Christmas, everyone is aware of your advent calendar and what it means. But even if you don't believe in religion, you believe in Christmas. We were no different. We were very excited. Setting off to get the tree with their dad, Christina, aged eight, Kieran, junior, aged 14, and Francesca, aged three. Their mum, Eleanor, and the baby stayed at home. Francesca was the most excited. It was the first Christmas Francesca was aware of what Christmas means, and I was trying to make it as special as possible. The children helped decorate the tree. Come on, Francesca. It's only me. Come on. Exhausted, Francesca eventually fell asleep on the sofa. She and Christina shared a bed. I wanted to give some sweets and then she was asleep. So um, I got in bed with her. On this occasion, Kieran was staying the night. By 11 p.m., everyone was in bed. Midnight. Wake up! Wake up! The house is on fire! Quick! Get the kids! Get the kids to get out! To be woken up, suffocating, disorientated, burning hot, thick, black, the hottest smoke. You can't breathe in, you can't breathe out, you can't see. Across the landing, three-year-old Francesca was the first to wake. I woke up and she was standing next to me bed. And then I got up and I didn't know what was going on. And the first thing I done was grab the hands. And I was thinking to put um, to support me blanket by my door to keep the smoke coming in, but then I thought, no, there's too much smoke in the room. To be in a situation where you're in that environment, terrifying, absolutely the most horrific thing. It was a living hell. Absolute horrendous, bright orange flames halfway up the stairs. The landing to the children's bedroom was ablaze. Kieran knew he, Eleanor, and the baby needed oxygen. 
we were shocked, so we didn't really, we didn't have anything to say because we were too nervous. Kieran Jr. was in the room next to the girls. Mum! Dad! I was saying to myself, I've got to get round to the kids so that they can make an escape. The flames and smoke were impassable. Kieran knew the only way he could rescue the children on the far side of the house was to jump from the window. Pain shot up my legs, and I think at that point it sprained my ankles, but they weren't broken. And I squeezed my way along the wall, screaming hysterical, help, help, help. So I opened the back gate, and I remember seeing a figure at the end of the path, staring. And that figure was crying heaps, and I was screaming. Help, help, help. Graham Heaps, Eleanor's sister Linda's recent boyfriend, lived within hearing distance of the screams. It seemed he'd already attempted a rescue. His face was burned and blackened. Frankie, Eleanor's brother, also arrived on the scene, alerted by a neighbour. And you know, I can only thank him for being such a hero to run like a madman at the door, boot the front door in, and run through blazing flames up the staircase. Amazing, amazing man. Kieran Jr. made the decision to jump from his bedroom window. His sisters were still trapped. At this stage, I thought, I'll start making my way along the side of the fence, onto the lower level roof, which was on top of the bay window. So then I let go of the hand to open the window because I heard people throwing stones at the window. And then I turned back to get it and she was gone. It was just smoke. I could only see smoke. So I pulled Christina by her shoulders and she seemed to jump into my arms as well at the same time. And as I turned to lower her, my feet gave way. And I remember falling. This time, both Kieran's ankles were broken. He was powerless to climb back up to rescue Francesca. Francesca sought refuge in the only place she could find, her bed. Across the landing, Eleanor's brother Frankie had fought his way to Eleanor's bedroom to rescue her and the baby. He chucked the baby out the window to one of the neighbours who caught the baby. He lowered down the dam through broken glass and cut her stomach open, lowering the dam from the window by her arms. He has won a prestigious bravery award for that, but no amount of awards can thank him for you know what he'd done on that night. At this point, fire crews arrived, summoned by a neighbour who'd seen an arc of flame flying across the garden. Cameras fixed to the fire engines recorded the scene. Frankie, who dropped from the window, was desperate to get back into the house where three-year-old Francesca was still trapped. He was so determined to force his way into the inferno, police had to arrest him for a public order offence, but he was not charged. Firefighters fought through smoke and flames to get to Francesca's bedroom. The only thing I can describe is the most blackest burnt remnants of my child was pulled out the house and the only thing I recognised was her pyjamas. I was hysterical. Francesca was alive, but she'd been found lying on her bed with 90% burns. Because I don't know the pain she felt, I don't know what she was feeling as a person, but as a father, I felt that pain. And it's an unbearable pain, it's an unbearable thing for any human being to experience as a parent, but as a baby, the pain scale is off the scale. And I just remember looking at the scene of devastation. I couldn't believe what had happened, but I remember something on fire in the corner of the garden, and the thing that was on fire was a petrol can. And another thing that was on fire was a human, and that human was Graham Heaps. Moments earlier, Kieran Jr. had seen Graham Heaps already injured, pulling his coat over his head and attempting to enter the blazing building. He'd been beaten back by flames. He was badly burned. 
all those hurt were taken to hospital. At Alder Hay, a battle began to save Francesca's life. My mum and my dad won't let me see her because she was like in a coma. I think she was in, I think she was, she was in a coma. My mum and my dad won't let me see her. I remember crying, asking to see her. I mean, the only way I can describe Francesca was the most injured person I've ever seen in my life. She had endless skin grafts. They amputated her fingers, her toes, her ears, her scalp. Her eyelids had to be replaced, her whole face and everything, all grafted, brand new skin. And standing in intensive care, kissing her and whispering into her ears, which ended up being amputated in the end because they were too badly burned, that everything was going to be OK and I knew in my heart that it wasn't going to be. Promising her that she'd be better and hospitals make you better and no matter what's happened to you, be strong. And I could see her trying so much. As the family prayed for Francesca to pull through, an investigation began into the cause of the fire. From the start, given the burning petrol can found in the garden, it was clear this could be arson, an attack endangering six lives. The inquiry was given to one of the most senior detectives in Merseyside. If this fire had been started deliberately, how, in the first instance, but more importantly, why? Why would somebody want to set fire to the house and kill the entire family? This would have been a mass murder. Fire investigators began a detailed examination of every inch of the burnt out house. Evidence quickly mounted this was indeed a deliberate attack. When I got to the front door of the property, I was overwhelmed by the smell of what I would regard as an ignitable liquid that it immediately as hair sticking up on the back of your neck. Marks on the floor indicated the fire had spread from the front door. What I could see was pore patterns, and that's just where an ignitable liquid's being poured on the floor. It leaves certain patterns on the floor, which are unusual. There was further telling evidence in the pattern of charring. The flames were so violent, their own heat drew them straight upstairs the adjacent living room, protected merely by a curtain doorway, was barely touched. That's really as a result of the ignitable liquid and the ferocity of the fire. It's acted like a chimney, if you like, shooting up the stairs. The front door, both on the inside and outside, was more extensively charred than the staircase, a clue to where the fire began. The door's on fire for longer than the staircase. So before the staircases become involved, we know that the door or around the door is already involved. Forensic scientists ruled out a heater in the hallway as a possible source of the fire. The internal sections of the heater were relatively untouched from fire compared with the external sections of the heater. Everywhere upstairs, there was evidence of the ferocity of the fire. Belongings stored in the loft had come crashing through the burn ceiling. Plaster falling off the wall is usually a, an indication of high temperature. Within the room where Francesca was and directly above the bed, the plaster had fallen off the wall. The heat layers hit the roof and then started its way down slowly, getting hotter and hotter towards Francesca while she's on the bed. Fire is the most destructive of all things. It doesn't leave any fingerprints. It doesn't leave any evidence, really, because it all gets destroyed in the fire. Investigators believed the full five litres held by the petrol can found in the garden was used to start the fire. It appeared like a very straightforward petrol container that somebody would buy. But the thing with the one that we recovered was it didn't have a nozzle. And I realised that for somebody to pour petrol through the letterbox, they would have needed the nozzle. And in the absence of the nozzle, the petrol would have splashed over the front door itself probably on the person who'd started the fire. A nozzle matching the make of the canister was found nearby, apparently dropped by the attacker. Without it, pouring the petrol could have taken minutes, allowing petrol fumes to mix with oxygen in the air. 
and that could explain the arc of fire seen by a neighbour. If I pour petrol and immediately set fire to it, I might get a bit of a whoosh. But if I pour a substantial amount of petrol and then leave it for a minute or two before I set that match or lighter to it, I'm going to get caught in an explosion. If I've got a petrol can in my hand or anything else in my hand, I will be thrown back with the petrol can. Fire is a particularly symbolic way of killing someone. It's got all the connotations of hell. You're unleashing hellfire on people. It's like the demons are coming out. And of course, it's a way of passing over responsibility. You just set the demons free. You just unleash them to do your dirty work for you. And the other point about fire, of course, is that you know that the suffering will be intense. It kind of erases someone entirely. It's not just killing them, it's obliterating them. And I rack my brain, who could it be? And then we started all coming up with the same name, Graham Hibbs. Couldn't have been Graham because he was trying to help, as far as we were concerned. Or was he? Why was he standing at the end of the path? Why was he the first person on the scene, above all the neighbours? Graham Heaps was being treated for burns in Fazakali Hospital. He was arrested, but he was so badly burned, police couldn't speak to him for two weeks. Graham Heaps lived nearby. He lived only a couple of roads away with his mother. So why would he be at the Bimson's house at that time of night? How did he get his injuries? And what were the reasons behind this? I didn't really know what to think. All sorts of things were going through me head, but I didn't think that it'd be Graham. <laughs> I didn't think that it'd be him, because he was easy and nice. On release from hospital, Graham was taken to St Anne Street Police Station for questioning. He told us what he'd been doing during that evening, that he'd been to work. When he'd finished work, he'd gone for a drink in the local pub. A bottle of that brandy there, please. When he'd left the local pub, he'd walked to an off-licence nearby. He'd bought a bottle of brandy, and then he'd walked home. He said he'd spent the evening at home with his mother, watching TV and drinking the brandy. But after a bit, once his mother had gone to bed, he went out again. Just stop out. Felt so hungry. He said, "I'm going to get something to eat." He went into some detail to tell us of the journey that he took. He told police his route took him down the 800-metre-long Sheil Road, a well-known red light area near his house. Trying a bit of business, darling. He was approached by a sex worker who offered him business, which he declined. He later admitted he'd used prostitutes for 27 years. He told police on this occasion he fancied buying drugs instead. See a few human lads hanging around, it's one match we wants to buy a weed, so I bought five pounds worth of cannabis. He said he then went to the chippy where he bought a quarter pound burger with cheese, onions, tomatoes and chilli sauce, then set off on the one kilometre walk home. Got back to the bottom of the road where I turned to walk into my street. Heard Ellen screaming with Francesca, shot into the post. Seen flames coming out of his door and ran into the house. If he was telling the truth, then he was a hero. He hadn't actually saved anybody, but he'd run into a burning building with the intention of trying to save people and had been quite badly burnt as a result. So. Was he a hero, or was there something a lot more sinister in what he was doing there that night? To answer this question, Merseyside police were to call in some extraordinary forensic expertise and a groundbreaking new technique. And something was about to happen which dramatically and tragically would raise the stakes in this case. After an arson attack on her Liverpool home, which could have wiped out her entire family, 
three-year-old Francesca Bimpson had been taken to hospital with 90% burns. Three weeks later, her family were asked to go to intensive care at Alder Hay Hospital. I thought she'd be all right and I got a necklace to give to her. And then my mum came into the waiting room and told us. There's not more they could do, so they unplugged all the machines and just left her with all the wires on it. And then just give it to me and Alney. I just remember it. Just passing away in our arms. I still, like, my heart feels like it's going to stop even explaining to you how bad it was. Such a brave little, tiny little precious thing. I was just trying to stay strong for my family. And I think I was the one that wasn't crying the most because I didn't want to upset my family. I remember it was a clear day and a funeral. We had a horse-drawn carriage. The best of the best, because we wanted her to have a funeral fitting a princess. A perfect, calm, lovely day turned into the most biggest snowflakes. And the most gorgeous farewell flake. The heavens were crying with snow. And she got carried in the pink coffin. And it was, that was the first funeral you know, that I've ever been to. I was under sad because I knew crying wouldn't do nothing. This was now a murder inquiry. Police suspected Graham Heaps, a former lover of Francesca's aunt, Linda. He'd been present at the scene. But forensic analysis of his clothing showed no trace of the petrol used to start the fire. When we started looking at Graham Heaps's life, we found that he had previous convictions. He'd been convicted of burglary before. He'd been in, convicted of an act of gross indecency. But what I did notice was he'd never been convicted of any acts of violence, and he'd never been convicted of any acts of arson or fire-related incidents. There was no violence or no history in his background that would make us believe that it was part of a pattern of his behaviour. Graham had given police an account of a two-kilometre round trip he'd made before arriving at the scene, including talking to a prostitute, buying cannabis from a gang, and having a burger. But when police spoke to his mother, who said he'd had his tea before going out, she gave crucial information showing his timings didn't add up. She was able to pinpoint the time he'd gone out. She'd been watching a television programme. It was quite clear with what had happened in the programme at the time that Graham went out. Just off out! Now, we were able to check the schedule of the programme and we knew that he'd left the house at about five minutes to midnight. The fire started five minutes later and Graham was seen outside the house moments after that. There was no time for him to have completed the half-hour journey he described to police. Furthermore, CCTV footage covering the route of his supposed journey showed no sign of him, and the owner of the chippy said he hadn't served him. And there was another discrepancy in his timings. He told us that as he got near to his home, which is near to where the Bimsons live, he heard screaming. And he's quite clear that he heard screams that were being made by Eleanor, Francesca's mum. But he actually heard her calling Francesca's name. But Eleanor never screamed Francesca's name till she'd already been rescued. By that time, Graham had been on the lawn for several minutes. Further incriminating evidence was found when Graham was arrested. He had a mobile phone in his pocket. He'd never rung for the emergency services. Now, he told us in an interview that he was a hero. Why didn't he call for the fire service? Why didn't he call for help? Police began looking more deeply into Graham's background, particularly his primary link to the family, his relationship with Linda. 
They learned that some months before the fire, Linda picked up on worrying signals in Graham's behavior. She started to fear him. Some months after his relationship with Linda began, Graham became aware Linda had started seeing a boyfriend from whom she'd previously split. Graham took the change in their relationship hard. Relationships are what everybody aspires to. We know how important these things are. And when a new relationship starts, you invest a lot in terms of thinking about how it could turn out. It really gets your imagination going. But of course, along with that, you do a huge emotional investment into the whole process. And then, of course, if things don't seem to be turning out the way you hoped for, this can be incredibly emotionally damaging. And some people react much worse than others. I don't think Graham Eubes was a father who could take no for an answer. When Linda said that she didn't want to continue with the relationship, he'd become, shall I say, quite forceful in his manner. What are you doing? You're on the phone to him again. Are you soft, are you? You're going to go back to him, are you? You're going to go back to him. Tell you what, you go back to him like... You go back to him and you're dead, OK? Get off me. Linda did go back to her ex-boyfriend and ditched Graham. But he wasn't about to give up. Graham's one of those fellas that you come across in life who's like a wasp, if you like. Can see the buzzes around the situation until he gets his own selfish needs met. Yeah. Right. On one occasion, she was on the phone and he robbed the phone out of her hand. Give me the phone. Give us it. Give me the phone. Graham removed the SIM card, then smashed the phone. There followed a series of sometimes obscene what phone calls doing? and text messages to people on Linda's contact list, including, repeatedly, Eleanor, trying to find out whether Linda was involved with anyone else. The calls came from her stolen number. Even though he never said it was him, he knew it was him. And it was usually talking about Eleanor's breast size or the new man in Linda's life's penis size. So why don't you come round to mine then and do the same for me? Some sort of perverse sexual undertone to everything. So I was aware of this and I warned him off. I said, I know it's you, Graham, because you've robbed a SIM card. Stay away, I know where you live, and yeah. stop the phone calls. And just as soon as they started, they stopped. It emerged it wasn't the first time Graham had stalked a woman. When he'd split with a previous girlfriend in 2006, he'd bombarded her with explicit and crude messages. He even sent a video of himself performing a sex act which the woman, alarmed, showed to police. He started stalking her, and he would sit in the pub where she used to work and stay there for, for a long time, watching her and waiting for her. Once, he hid outside the pub and waited for her. The woman's boss was worried for her safety and called a taxi to take her home. When the woman began a new relationship, Graham started sending threatening messages. More and more jealous, he knocked on the door of the boyfriend. Yeah? Sorry, uh, wrong address. Oh, nice. OK. Stalking's all about obsessive behaviour, and one of the commonest types of stalking is when people are rejected by their partner and they simply can't deal with it. Now, why can't they deal with it? Because relationships are so important to us, and people feel kind of shame and embarrassment when they're rejected. So some people manage to turn that into anger and rage against the person. And what they're saying to the person is that you might think I'm no longer part of your life, but think again. And they invade their personal space, their personal time. They will send images of themselves to say, look, I know you cannot stop thinking about me. I'm going to make sure there are images in your head. Just think about this. So it's a way of dealing with your emotional feelings in an irrational way. There was one message from the time Graham was with Linda which took on significance following the fire. 
I want my money. He'd got into an argument over money with Linda's relative, Lee. Get me money, right? Later, Graham sent Lee a text which said he'd burn Lee and his family in their beds if Lee didn't pay back money owed. Graham was still living with his mother round the corner from the Bimpsons. Kieran heard he was back drinking at the Derby pub. He warned police Graham should be moved for his own safety. Rumours were rife in the local area that Graham Eaps was out and about, even though he was number one suspect. The local community was starting to become a bit of a lynch mob, shall we say. Police advised Graham to move in with friends in a tower block in the adjacent area of Old Swan. There was a lot of tension in the community as a result of the fire. But after Francesca died on the 23rd of December, the tension became incredible. People in the community believed that he was responsible for Francesca's death. We advised him to move away from the area to a secret location in South Wales. We believed that he was responsible, but at this stage, we didn't have enough evidence. But that was about to change. Previously, it had not been possible to prove there were traces of petrol on Graham's clothing. But after a TV appeal, a woman from a chemical analysis company came forward to tell detectives about groundbreaking new technology. She said her scientists would be able to find minute traces of petrol additives, even if the petrol itself had burned. They were able to prove to us Graham Heaps had petrol on the front of his trousers and on his training shoes. But importantly, they were able to tell us that it was splashed on his clothes in such a way that as he'd thrown petrol through the letterbox, the petrol had splashed back from the letterbox and onto his clothing. The location of the splashes on Graham's clothing coincided with burns on his body, and the scientists were able to identify the exact brand of petrol used. Each brand has unique additives, and each additive leaves a distinctive residue. They were also able to tell us that the petrol on his clothes was the same as the petrol in the can that was used to cause the fire, and from the mat and from the scene of the fire. At this stage, we knew that Graham Heaps was responsible for pouring the petrol through the letterbox, and as a result of which, he'd got petrol on his clothes. This was a compelling link, but Merseyside police still needed to prove Graham had ignited the petrol. They hoped his burns may provide further evidence. Photos taken immediately after the fire were sent to an expert in London. The burns of the face were really quite different from those of the arms and legs. The burns at the face were relatively superficial and had features consistent with a classical flash burn injury. The burns of the arms and legs, however, were much deeper and more consistent with flame burns. The flame, particularly on the left-hand side, appeared to have started at the wrist and travelled as a tongue along the forearm. This almost certainly with the arm hanging down. The burns at the legs were again deep, but the appearances were of splash marks, and that either from accelerant on the skin and ignited, or of clothing that was a light, uh, then coming in contact with the skin. The burns to Graham Heaps's face suggested a sudden, almost momentary, explosive burst of heat. The injuries a record of a split second of time. Particularly of note were the creases around the eye at the crow's feet, um, at the side of the eye, where there were clearly areas that weren't burnt, um, suggesting that the eyes were screwed up at the point in time at which the face was injured. Most damning of all, the injuries revealed the direction of the blast coming from below the head and leaving areas of skin untouched, effectively in shadow. The distribution included the uh, columella of the nose and the underside of the chin, but it spared areas above on the nose. All this suggesting a directional element to the blast of heat uh, from below the head. Once we heard that, we knew that Graham Heaps was responsible for starting the fire. So what had actually happened, as Frankie had gone into the house and had started to rescue the family, Graham Heaps had obviously decided that he would run into the fire to mask the injuries that he'd got 
to make himself look like a hero, but to be able to give an account for his burns. But the expert that we had was able to tell us that the burns he suffered on the second occasion were very different from the first, which would cause when he started the fire. Officers drove to the secret location in Wales where Graham had been sent for his own safety, charged him with murder and brought him back to Liverpool. They believed they now had a clear picture of what really happened on the night of the fire. Graham Heaps had been drinking that night. He was walking home and as he walked down Norwood Grove, he saw Linda walking away from the Bimson's house. She ignored him. And we believe that that was the catalyst that brought about his actions that night and the reason why he started the fire. They had a trigger, they had evidence, but would police have enough to persuade a jury and bring Graham Heaps to justice? Graham Heaps had been charged with murder following an arson attack on an entire family in which three-year-old Francesca Bimpson received fatal injuries. His trial at Liverpool Crown Court lasted for seven weeks. One thing the prosecution had to prove was motive. He'd had a number of relationships that he'd been rejected, but he was really troubled by the relationship with Linda and the breakdown of that relationship. He wanted to hit back at Linda. He didn't want to harm her, but he wanted to harm those who were close to her. The only motive I can see was Linda's got support around her family. That support is gaining momentum to dissolve the relationship that he had with Linda by keeping him away from her. He didn't want to kill Linda because he always had aspirations of getting with her again. He wanted to be a hero, so maybe if he lit the fire and then helped get people out, Linda would get back to him. Like the knight in shining armour on the night, rescuing her traumatised and burning family from a blazing house. But his plan was as warped as his brain. Sometimes you can understand pure evil in psychological terms. This was a story about someone who was rejected and responded in a particular way. He thought that the world thought of him as a weak person, a person who could be ignored. And he was determined to show the world that he couldn't be ignored and that he still had power. And he exerted that power in the only way he thought that he could. Throughout his trial, Graham remained impassive, studying legal documents, sucking his pen, I got to the stage where I was fed up looking at his weasel face staring back at me. And I started becoming more and more agitated. It took the jury three and a half hours to find Graham guilty. The judge said this was a cowardly attack motivated by sheer spite. Graham was sentenced to a minimum of 28 years. I remember him getting sentenced and instead of breaking down in tears and screaming, an innocent man, he just said two words, thank you. And at that stage, I had police all around me, hands on my thighs, hands on my arms, stopping me from getting to him. It's always difficult to investigate the murder of a child, but at the end of the investigation, it was satisfying to convict Graham Heaps and to bring some degree of closure to the family, knowing that he was convicted for Francesca's murder. For the surviving members of the family, that wasn't the end of the tragedy. Kieran and Eleanor have split up, their relationship unable to cope with the grief of Francesca's death. There's always family left behind that try and make sense of the aftermath of the loss of a loved one. And me and Eleanor, still to this day feel the loss of our lovely daughter Francesca and everything we've ever known as normal as a couple will never be normal again and I suppose what made us split up finish our relationship together it's the loss it's the blame it's the guilt
In an attempt to create something positive from what has happened, Kieran has set up and runs a charity, the Francesca Bimpson Foundation, which helps victims of serious crime. Eleanor now works for the Fire Support Network, helping prevent fires in the home. Francesca is buried in St Chad's Church Cemetery in Liverpool. It's the guilt of survival that's killing me. I survived and Francesca didn't, and I suppose to sum up how I feel as a parent, I feel like I failed Francesca. I feel like I failed all my kids because they lost Francesca. And most importantly, Francesca lost a life. I lost my daughter, Christina, Kieran, and Marie. Elna, we all had a unique bond and that bond's broken and it'll never ever return. He has torn the family in two, we haven't, we've, we've lost a member of the family and me and my dad all together. And if, it, if he didn't do what he did, if he didn't do what he did, then the, 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 it would be just be happy like it was then.